1. Backstory I knew Kevin back in high school, in the mid to late 90s in central Scotland. Back in those days, most people in my circle were very homophobic and never really knew about the gay community. As stupid high school kids, we often used the word gay as an insult as well as the negative stereotypes that went with them. Fortunately, nowadays, people are more open-minded and more accepting of the LGBTQ plus community. Now, Kevin was very gullible and believed that everything that other kids said about gay people was true. And I mean the really stupid stuff like all gay men wear pink or talk with an effeminate voice and were all automatically transvestites and all gay men are attracted to every man and would immediately try to bang them as soon as their ass is in view, etc, etc. Now, most people grow out of this stupidity and move on. But not Kevin, because he believed that even looking up facts about the gay community meant that you will catch it and become one of them. You heard that right, people. He thought it was contagious. Now to the story. Ten years after leaving high school, I'm walking down in Main Street shopping district, and I see this big pink one-man pride march waddling towards me in high heels and a feather boa. Huge sun hat, skin-tight yoga pants and big sunglasses. Everything he was wearing was pink. He was also wearing lipstick and had his nails done. I was stunned when this giant ball of cotton candy started talking to me in the fakest over-effeminate voice I had ever heard. This guy sneezed glitter, he was so gay. Oh, how are you doing, darling? It's been ages since I've seen your sweet face. Uh, do I know you? It's me, Kevin, or Karen, as I go by now. Kevin? Did you lose a bet or something? What's with the get-up? Now, Kevin usually wears workout clothes or expensive jeans and a t-shirt. Oh, I'm just being me. I came out six months ago. Oh, congrats. I'm proud of you for being so open about it. But also explain why you were so homophobic in high school. You were just deflecting. I get it now. No, silly, I wasn't gay then. Like I said, I've only been gay for six months. Now, I'm straight, and I have a few friends that are gay, bisexual and lesbian, and know that if you're gay, you're usually born that way. So I knew something was amiss. We were a few doors down from a bar and asked if we wanted to have a drink to catch up. Of course, he says yes and proceeds to order the most flamboyant cocktail he could think of. While he sipped from his glass of fruit and umbrellas, I asked him about his car. For context, Kevin was a very good mechanic and bought the frame of a BMW 320 from a scrapyard for a couple of hundred. He then spent over a year working on it, spending his savings on the leather interior, the incredible sound system and speakers, and he turned the engine to perfection, including a nitrous kit. He put a silver trim around the coach line and painted it in the richest black I've ever seen, and the wheels were £1,000 each. It was beautiful and by far his most prized possession. Oh, that horrible thing. I sold it for £500 to someone and bought a Volkswagen Beetle bug convertible in bubblegum pink. <laughs> what? Oh, yes, you know that gays can't drive black BMWs. It's illegal. And, of course, you know that gays are bad with money. I was genuinely horrified by this statement and then remembered that Kevin was an avid collector of football and soccer memorabilia. He had signed shirts and programs that were worth a small fortune. With my head in my hands, I'm afraid to ask, what about your football memorabilia? I threw it away, of course. It's illegal for gays to like sports. Everyone knows this. As he chuckles to me, thinking I'm an idiot, I see Steve walking in, getting ready for the night shift, so I call him over. Now, Steve is a very big guy and has lots of tattoos and even more scars. He says hello to me, and I introduce him to Kevin. Kevin, this is Steve. Oh, hello there. Hi. He's a man of few words. Steve, tell Kevin what you do for a living. I'm head bouncer in charge of security. And what did you do before this? I was in the parachute regiment. And what car do you drive? Mercedes AMG. I forgot what type. I'll ask him the next time I see him. And what's your favourite football team? Celtic. And I'm a season ticket holder and have been for years. And what's your boyfriend's name? Frank. At that point, Kevin's head jumps up, and his eyes were bulging out of his head. 
What? You heard. Tell me something, Kevin. Excuse me, Karen. Please explain to us how you came out. Well, I was at the cup final and my team scored the winning goal just as the final whistle blew. I was so excited I grabbed the person next to me thinking it was a girl I saw earlier and gave them a big kiss. Afterwards I saw it was a man. I must have caught gay so that was it. I'm gay now. Nothing I can do about it. It's the law. Myself and Steve look in disbelief at how stupid that sounds and in unison shout out, You're not gay! We then sit there and have a long talk about the reality and the BS, when all of a sudden we could see the penny drop, and it dropped with a clang. Kevin leaps up screaming, MA BEAMER! Not the fact that he'd been living as a gay man for six months, no, his car was more important. He runs out of the bar down the high street straight into a clothing store. He's in there for about five minutes and then comes running out, wearing a tracksuit with the tax still on running to his car, the pink Volkswagen, and peeled out of the street as fast as the poor car could go. Me and Steve look at each other and jump in his Mercedes and chase after him. Why, you ask? <laughs> Simple, it was too good to miss. We followed him to his house and watched as he stormed inside. The next thing we hear is shouting and swearing and then items being thrown out of his window, mostly clothes, all pink and fluffy, as well as a few... <clears throat> marital aids, just laying in the street. Then we see this poor little guy in tears being thrown out by Kevin and holding a bag with his belongings. We helped him pick his stuff up and gave him a lift to his friend's house. He turned out to be Kevin's boyfriend of six months. Now Kevin is back to the way he was and denying it ever happened. But now has an open mind and a newfound respect for the LGBTQ plus community. I haven't seen him for a while now, but every time I do, I call him Karen just to piss him off. Two. So my brother, Kevin, for this story, might be the dumbest man alive. Some Kevins just do random shit. This Kevin's a different breed. He got 100% creativity stats at birth, but God spent all of the intelligence points in that and none on safety or analytical thinking. I think a good story to attune you to the Kevin frequency will be this one. The time he set the shed on fire. It was pouring rain one afternoon, and Kevin decided it would be a good day to barbecue, because it'll be safer to do when it's raining to prevent fires. <laughs> okay. Except Kevin did it inside the shed. He managed to set the shed on fire and barely escape alive. With a very toasted right foot and 4,000 pounds in hospital bills by the time it was done. Another moment of spectacular stupidity was him applying to over 400 scholarship opportunities as a high school freshman instead of a college freshman. Because he thinks universities or high schools, they're higher than the last place I went. How the hell he even got into college, I have no idea. He got a 740 on the SAT really bad, and a 2.52 GPA in high school. He fucked another man in the school bathroom. He is bi, not a problem to me that it was another man, but this did not please the school district in the state we live in, and spent two weeks of senior year suspended. Kevin was also a complete dipshit to me personally when I was starting college, though we've more or less buried the hatchet. Unlike him, I went out of state for college because... I have half a brain and don't want to live in a shithole. Unspecified for anonymity reasons. But I go to school in California, and my family and Kevin live in the Midwest USA. Not a week after I leave for college do I get a text from Kevin demanding I call him immediately for a family emergency. I do, only to hear him tell me about a rumor he heard that David Ortiz, famous retired baseball player, likes putting baseball bats on his own ass. I think maybe Kevin was just projecting. Kevin said he needed to call me because I used to be there to talk to him and proceeds to give me an insulting spiel about how I'm a stupid liberal for moving away from the family. Ironically, my parents encouraged me to do it. It's not like anyone but Kevin disagreed with my decision. 
Oh yeah, back in freshman year of high school, actual, not Kevin definition, he googled how does an IED work on a school computer. He claimed later he meant to search IUD so he could know whether he could make his girlfriend get one. Not only dumb, but I see why he became a Republican. Kevin once went to lift weights and came back home three hours later with a gruesome bruise on his cheek and blood around his mouth. I asked him what happened and he says some random nutbag, word he uses, I never heard this one before, attacked him on the street but he fought back and beat him away. I asked why he didn't go to the cops, etc. The more I ask him about it, the more inconsistencies pop up in his story. When confronted, he admits he dropped a 35-pound dumbbell on his face. He got pissed off and yelled back at me while walking away that you couldn't even lift that much. All you do is sit on your ass alone. I decided to engage him, which resulted in my dad having to keep me from punching him. Another time, and this was back when he was 14, still a high school freshman, Kevin decided to run alongside the school bus shirtless in the morning because... Buses move real slow and the girls will see my gains. He obviously could not keep up with the pace of a moving bus. He also bought a bag of frozen fish at the store and tried eating frozen cod fillets before we explained to him that it didn't work like that. And frozen fish isn't a snack food. But the story that really takes the cake is the time he tried to do geoengineering on our neighborhood. Kevin went outside early one evening and nobody noticed until about midnight that he wasn't back. I step outside and see he's dug a trench maybe two feet deep, all the way from my mom's garden to the creek in the back of our house. He's squatting at the bank of the creek, yelling at the water. Just fucking flow upward. It's not that fucking hard. That's Kevin for you. Three. Kevina is an older cousin of mine, 50s to 60s, who has an identical twin sister. She's not the focus of this story, but she'll play a role in it. Let's call her Kevat. Kevat is a therapist of many years and has enjoyed a relatively successful career. How this is possible remains an utter mystery to me, as she specializes in working with cross-cultural clients, and once argued with me for an hour, trying to convince me that India was in South America. I could write loads more about Kevat and her dubious credentials as a therapist, but I'd have to make it a full-time job. Suffice to say for now that Kevat is a well-established therapist, and Kevina wants very much to follow in her sister's footsteps. She fumbles her way through her bachelor's degree as an adult, and starts the process of applying for her master's degree. And thus, our story begins. One day, Kevat calls me up and says she's concerned about Kavina's application. She claims that Kavina is listing Kavat as a reference, something which she has reluctantly agreed to. She wants me to call Kavina up and persuade her that this is a bad idea. I'm not sure I can persuade her, as reason is not her strong suit. But I give it a chance anyway. After addressing her sister's concerns, Kavina argues with me saying that the dean has told her that including her sister as a reference is permissible. I try to reason with her saying, permissible is not the same thing as desirable. She'll likely be left straight out of the admissions process with a reference from her twin sister. And that's when she drops the bomb. Not to worry. She's asked Kevat not to mention that she's family in the application. <laughs> Problem solved. After an embarrassingly long time, Kavat and I managed to convince her that this strategy is at best misleading, and at worst legally actionable. She begrudgingly accepts my advice, and instead opts for a reference from a professor. In some bizarre twist of fate, she manages to get accepted into the program. Smooth sailing for a few months afterwards, until her first term paper was due. Kavina is over at my house at a family gathering, and has brought her paper over. She received a poor grade and is asking the family for advice on how to fix it. I am a graduate student who has taught a writing course in the past, and figured, what the hell, let's give this a shot. I take a quick glance over the paper, and in my politest tone inform her that I cannot edit her essay as written. 
as there are simply too many formatting problems. My grandmother, a retired lawyer with a few more brains to pick than the sisters, Kevin, or me for that matter, the woman's pretty sharp, asks me why I can't just ignore the formatting issues for now and focus on the writing. In response, I simply hand her the paper and watched her concerned expression sink into utter abject horror. What I handed to her could hardly be called an essay. The sentences she had written, few and far between as they were, were spread out whole pages apart, and often broken apart mid-phrase. Page numbers littered random spots across each page, and only rarely corresponded with the actual page number of the document. At first, I was convinced that there was some kind of bizarre software compatibility issue, she had written this essay on a MacBook at home and used pages, and then tried to print it on a PC. That must be it, right? I ask her as much, and she seems confused. She insists that she wrote the essay on a Word document. Not Microsoft Word, but Word document. The program. She claimed her IT guy at work had told her to do this. I was forced to assume that this unfortunate man had tried to inform her of the difference between a program and file, a confusing and eldritch distinction which had undoubtedly proven far too much for Kavina's simple mind. Lucky me, Kavina had an electronic copy of the essay on her. After wrestling with the format issues, I was finally able to get a peek at what Kavina apparently thought passed for writing. The paper consisted entirely of disjointed sentences that were vaguely related to the topic at hand, and which rarely followed any semblance of grammar. The paper frequently went into digressions about the author's personal life. The paper was a book review, and that had nothing to do with the actual topic of the book. In short, the paper was written as if a textbook had gotten sick and vomited words from vaguely related chapters onto its pages. Sometime later, I ended up discussing this paper with a graduate student friend of mine who laughed. Well, at least it's not plagiarized, they said. I laughed in response. I laughed some more. Then I abruptly stopped laughing. Somewhere in the writhing mass of words was a set of sentences which just seemed too coherent. Suddenly I thought, I'm just being paranoid. There was no way Kavina had actually researched the material well enough to have found a way to plagiarize. I pull up the paper on my computer, find the phrase in question, and pop it into Google. Sure enough, a full three sentences of the paper had been lifted straight from a newspaper's review of the book. No citation, no credit, no nothing. I immediately called Kavina up. To let her know what she's done could have extremely serious long-term consequences. She then argues with me, claiming that since her professor told her she didn't have to cite her sources, she would be okay. It took at least an hour of convincing for her to finally back down. Last I heard, Kavina has a writing tutor. She's told me the tutor claims he's seen worse writing. I'm not sure if he's being nice or if that's actually true. Frankly, either possibility horrifies me. 4. So this guy was in my church congregation growing up. The kid was a complete mess. His dad was always on the verge of going broke, except when he was doing so well he would spend every cent they had. He was the second youngest in a family of like eight or something. Tons of kids. His mom was an anti-vaxxer who refused to treat his ADHD with medicine. She would instead give him a caffeinated Coke every morning. Like, caffeine can help ADHD? I have ADHD. I use caffeinated drinks to get me through little bursts of stuff, like an exam or something. But this kid was a danger to himself with how bad his impulse control and inability to focus were. He'd always been dumb growing up. My dad was a doctor who would help his family out when they were broke with free medical care. They had to call first, and it would always be at our house, so broken bones or serious surgeries were a no-go. And boy was that kid a frequent visitor. Stitches, splints, the whole nine yards. You name it. This kid had somehow done it to himself. It was almost inspiring to see how hard he worked at it, but I digress. 
By the age of 12, we were all in the midst of being hornier and stupider than we'd ever been before. Thus, it made perfect sense for our church to enroll us all in the good old Boy Scouts of America. This is the start of my first story with him. We went camping, as Boy Scouts do, and to make it funnier, we did it as a big organized campout. Several nearby church congregations all invited their kids to go, and we had nearly 200 kids in one outing by the time it was all said and done. Kevin, of course, came along with us, he stayed in our tent, and he ate with all of us at meals. In regular scouting activities, he was an irritating but omnipresent participant. He was so irritating that his infamy began to spread to us, and by the end of our three-day mountain excursion, we were the most despised of all the Boy Scout troops. The very last day of our trip, we were given free time to play in the woods. Me, my little brother, some friends from my troop, and Kevin decided we would explore the woods nearby. As we were hiking around, this group of kids from the campsite next to ours yells something at us. A second later, a rock whizzes overhead. I turn around angry, but more rocks were already incoming. Their leader, a little weasel-faced shitlord I can talk about later, comes running after us with a stick. No explanation. Nobody knows why. We just thought they were dicks. Being Boy Scouts and also healthy, semi-sane, 12 to 14-year-old boys, we already had sticks, so it was war. Their leader swung at my brother, I smashed the stick out of his hand in retaliation, and then swung at his reinforcements after a few seconds before he shuts, Oh, fuck off! to us. Let's go back to camp, to his backup. I originally asked him what his problem was, and he just shook his head and goes, You guys are sick. You think you're so funny. You're not. We were looking forward to that watermelon all trip, assholes. And stomps off angrily back to his camp. Watermelon? Sick? What was he talking about? I asked myself, and we continued our walking. When we returned to camp later that day, we could see the remnants of a smashed watermelon on the ground. I would have blamed Kevin, but he'd been with us since dawn. I guess some other camp had done it as a prank and we got blamed for it. We were closest to them, and we were associated with the single most irritating 12-year-old boy on this earth. Their faulty assumption made sense. Just as I'm coming to this conclusion, though, their scout leader sees we've returned and storms angrily up to our leader. A heated conversation ensues, and Kevin is clearly the cause of it. But why, you ask? He hadn't smashed the watermelon. You said so yourself. He had an alibi. Well, dear listener, the alibi only extended to that morning. As we are soon to learn, Kevin's deeds took place under the cover of night. During the early morning, Kevin awoke with an erection common to be present boys. But Kevin was in our tent. He couldn't go jerking the gherkin in a tent we would suddenly awaken and chastise him. Doing that on a church trip surely would not go over well. Instead of waiting until the next day, when by the evening he would be home, or simply going to the forest to spill his seed, he decided it was time for a twofold revenge. The camp next to us had been mean to him, seemingly for no reason. All he had done was irritate, harass, and heckle them for two whole days and in turn they had the audacity to call him annoying and make jokes about his behavior to others. This was unacceptable, unbearable, unbelievable. Kevin could barely stomach the thought of the humiliation he had faced, and he knew that group had been saving a prize watermelon for their last day in the woods, a treat for their efforts at camp. This brings me to the second part of this two-part revenge. For so long, watermelon seeds had been inside him. Now it was his chance to put his seeds inside a watermelon. Thus, in the wee hours of the morning, Kevin snuck into the neighboring camp, carved a hole into their special watermelon, and, well, the deed done, he returned to our tent and slept peacefully. The afternoon following, the camp of kids was getting ready to dig into the melon when they discovered what had occurred. They immediately knew who had done it. 
in anger and to prevent anyone from consuming the tainted melon's flesh, they themselves smashed the watermelon. Then they took to the woods as an armed and angry mob out for revenge. We had no idea. Kevin hadn't bragged about it. He thought it would be a secret he took with him to his grave. Instead, he nearly got us all beat up. The conclusion to that story is he got ripped a new one. The scout leader, the congregation leader, and his parents all chastised him severely. He was allowed on future campouts, but was always watched very closely by us and our leadership, especially around the fruit. 5. A while back, I used to work as a manager at a popular pizza chain, where I had to deal with many Kevins. However, there's one that really sticks out to me. Kevin, the master pizza innovator. This happened a few weeks after I had become a shift lead and had just started assistant manager training. When my general manager put me in charge of training new employees, he claimed it was part of my training, but actually it turned out he was just lazy and made me do his job for him so he could goof off. But that fiasco is a story for another time. Kevin had been working at the store for about two months and ideally we would have trained him on how to work the line after his second week. However, this was a Kevin so things were not ideal. I devoted a lot of time to helping coach Kevin through simple things. Although he seemed to understand in the moment, I would regularly have to reteach him after a few shifts. Honestly, I didn't mind too much because at the time our store was extremely understaffed due to the GM not hiring anyone, and I was just happy to have a body to fill a position on the busy days. He would tag things on the wrong boxes, despite there being a clear guide with pictures right next to the tagging area. He would forget to take card information. I even caught him sleeping multiple times during day shift in the view of the carryout. However, no customers ever saw, and I really needed the help, so I never said anything. The trouble with Kevin came when I was asked to train him on the make line after one of our insiders turned in their two weeks notice and we would need more help in the make line. I was especially hands-on with his training on the make line because I needed him to be at least somewhat competent. Unfortunately, he was called to action far before he was ready when the quitting insider stopped showing up a week before his two weeks was up. When the dinner rush hit, the only people there were me, Kevin, and the GM. Our store had a conveyor belt oven, and typically, during a dinner rush on a day with that volume of sale, we would have needed two people on ovens, one person stretching dough, and three people on the make line with a fourth working on sides. My GM decided that he could watch ovens and left me and Kevin to work the make line. I had managed to prepare a good amount before the dinner rush had started, and we started off strong. However, once my prep was exhausted, we began falling behind, despite my best attempts to shift into maximum overdrive. I simply could not make up for the lack of people. There was one bright side. While he was much slower than I needed him to be, Kevin was doing better than I had hoped. He did not mess up a pizza until about 30 to 45 minutes into rush. When I catch a glimpse of the oddest thing, it took a few moments and three hastily made and beautiful pizzas before I realized what I saw. Kevin had taken a pizza and folded it in half. I looked back over and Kevin was turned to face me, an uncooked pizza folded into a burrito-looking shape held out stretched to me. Then I hear the words that I can still clearly hear in my mind to this day. It's a pizza roll! I just picked up the pizza I had just finished and took it to the oven. Then I continued working. I had neither the time or the patience to deal with that at that moment. He tossed the pizza roll away and began working on his next pie. After the rush was over, I pulled Kevin aside, asked why he would make a pizza roll during dinner rush. I slobbered on it. I was probably more caught off guard that I should have been hearing a grown man tell me he slobbered on a pizza, but whatever. However, to this day... I have no idea how he slobbered on the pizza, because we weren't talking. He made no noise. He wasn't even doing his normal obnoxiously loud sing-alongs that he did when he was cleaning. 
I'm likely reading too much into it, though. Hey everybody, Hellfreezer here, and thank you very much for listening to A Cacophony of Kevins, Episode 7. And thank you very much to everybody who allowed me to use their stories in this video. Before you go, if you could please boop the like button, and share the video with friends and family members. And thank you kindly to those who already have. Okay, I think this one's going up on a Monday. That's the only one I'm sure of. And, uh, no special... Nope, no, we're all good. Okay, so let's move right along to Hellfreezer's question of the day. And today's question is... What is your definition of self-care? What do you do when you're feeling low, the end of a tough day, and you just need to do things to reset yourself to get back a little bit of sanity? For me, it's watching a movie, a TV show, I'll put on an audiobook, a podcast. So it's usually sound and vision. Sometimes I'll relax in the Hellfreezer Discord and I'll play games with some of the good folks there. There will inevitably be some kind of snacks or a good meal involved at the same time. And a good shave and a shower always puts you right as well. Let me know what some of your ideas are in a comment below. And with that, I'm going to head off for now. So until next time, thank you very much for listening, and take very good care of yourself.